we would like to introduce Sharon Slater, who serves as president of Family Watch International and the co-chair of the UN Family Rights Caucus. She is our host today. And Sharon, we welcome you here and we turn the time over to you. Great, thank you, Travis. I am so excited to have all of you who are on this call and on this webinar, UN Women Exposed When Women's Rights Become Women's Wrongs. As we watched the people signing up for this webinar, I believe we got to now people from 75 different countries. So this is very exciting as we start this worldwide movement for the family. If you've been to my other webinar that we did on the World Health Organization, you will notice that we will just do a few of the same slides to just catch us up on what Family Watch International does and what our mission is. We work to protect the family as a fundamental unit of society. And we work at the United Nations. We have consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. That means we have the opportunity to go in when UN conferences are going on and UN negotiations of UN member states and have an impact there. It also means that we've been able to witness the attack on the family from UN agencies, from UN treaty bodies, UN special rapporteurs, UN accredited NGOs, and the UN review mechanism called the Universal Periodic Reviews. Today, our webinar is gonna focus on UN women. And before we launch into it, I have a disclaimer here. Family Watch International acknowledges the good things that UN Women has done for women's rights throughout the world. There are many individuals affiliated with UN Women who have the best interests of women at heart. However, at the same time, we acknowledge that there are individuals within the agency who do have harmful agendas. There are too many policies and programs that are blatantly anti-life and anti-family. When such policies and programs are implemented, they have serious negative impacts on families and on health and the innocence of children worldwide, and they must be exposed and eliminated. So here are the topics we're gonna to cover related to UN Women. Part one will be UN Women 101, the role, structure, and activities of UN Women. Part two, UN Women leadership concerns. And part three, UN Women's abortion and LGBT agendas as documented and UN Women's own publications and their Gender Equality Forum materials and preparations. So let's start with part one, UN Women 101, Structure, Roles, and Activities. Very briefly, UN Women has an executive board that consists of UN member states, 41 UN member states elected to three-year terms by the UN Economic and Social Council. And those slots for that board are allocated according to region and they rotate. UN Women on their website lists the following roles. To support intergovernmental bodies, such as the Commission on the Status of Women in their formulation of policies, global standards and norms, to help member states implement these standards, standing ready to provide suitable technical and financial support and more. Three, to lead and coordinate the UN system's work on gender equality. And we're going to be focusing a lot on number three and how UN Women promotes gender equality. The UN Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals that all the world agreed to, all UN member states, number five is the goal on gender equality. And this is the goal that UN Women has pushed and is tasked with monitoring and pushing forward. Some of the main UN activities that Family Watch has cataloged is Number one, UN Women hosts the UN Commission on the Status of Women annually. That's probably one of the biggest activities they do. Number two, UN Women facilitate states' compliance with the Beijing Platform for Action. We'll learn more about that in a minute. UN Women maintains offices at regional and national levels to promote its agendas. So let's start with the UN Commission on the Status of Women, which UN Women hosts annually. This is a gathering of governments, all the UN member states. You have NGOs, non-governmental organizations coming from all around the world. Usually around at least 3,500 people come to promote the rights of women. And at the UN Commission on the Status of Women, commonly referred to as CSW, they review different elements of the Beijing Platform for Action. They hold plenary sessions for governments where they can talk about all the good things that they're doing to advance women's rights. 
UN member states hold side events, events that promote a specific issue that a UN member state is passionate about related to women's rights. And Family Watch sometimes co-hosts these events with governments and, and tries to present the pro-family side of the issues. And then there's NGO parallel events. These are events put on across the street from the United Nations, sometimes hundreds in numbers, where NGOs are pushing their agendas related to the theme or, and women's rights. And then the main part of CSW, which we're gonna talk about, are the negotiations on what's called agreed conclusions. That's the name of the document each year with a sub-theme related to the Beijing Platform for Action and Women's Rights. And that's where the rubber meets the road because all nations agree to implement the policies that, the, that they negotiate at CSW. So the UN Commission on the Status of Women has 45 UN member states that serve at any given time as members of that commission. And again, those seats are allocated according to region and they rotate. Then you have the CSW NGO activities that are going on. As I mentioned, there's parallel events going on across the street from the United Nations. And those are organized by what's called the NGO CSW New York. It's an NGO that registers different other NGOs to put on events to push their agendas. And the NGO CSW is very, very controversial. They have strong positions on women's issues that have been illustrated by the fact that they put on their website this picture of the Women's Wave Rises, the Women's March on Washington, which promoted all sorts of controversial agendas under the banner of women's rights. So that's the UN Commission on the Status of Women. Then we'll talk about now facilitating states compliance with the Beijing Platform for Action. What is this document? The Beijing Platform for Action, which was negotiated by UN member states and signed by all UN member states over 25 years ago, promotes rights of women in various ways. In fact, these are the critical areas of concern that are listed in the Beijing Platform for Action and they all sound really nice, but some of these issues have been distorted, as we will show, such as women in decision-making, human rights of women, women in health. Many times they're advancing women's wrongs as women's rights through these issues. So let's talk about abortion, which is the main thing that is being promoted by the United Nations in various ways, and we're going to illustrate how UN Women is doing this. They take are provisions out of the Beijing Platform for Action. This is paragraph 97. And they take, for example, this line, unsafe abortion threatens the lives of a large number of women. With that line, when it was negotiated by UN member states, most member states were pro-life and they thought, oh, yeah, abortions threaten the lives of a large number of women. We need to put this in here. But I don't think nations realized how deceptive it was to have the word unsafe modify abortions because those who are advancing abortion take the same language and say, oh, abortions are unsafe where it's illegal, so we need to legalize them to make them safe and therefore unsafe abortions will not threaten the lives of a large number of women. That's very, very deceptive. But we can tell that those who originally signed on, the governments that signed on to the Beijing Platform for Action, were not wanting to push abortion in general because you also have this part of Beijing paragraph 97 that says, the right of access to appropriate healthcare services that will enable women to go safely through the pregnancy and childbirth and provide couples with the best chance of having a healthy infant. And then you have Beijing paragraph 106K, which says in no case should abortion be promoted as a method of family planning. All governments to deal with health impact of unsafe abortion as a major public health concern are to reduce the recourse to abortion and every attempt should be made to eliminate the need for abortion. Very anti-abortion. And then paragraph 106K says, any measure or changes related to abortion within the health system can only be determined at the national or local level. So, UN Women has no business promoting abortion. This is supposed to be determined by nations. The tricky thing here is the next line. This line is a line that's used by pro-abortion advocates from the Beijing Platform for Action. It says, in circumstances where abortion is not against the law, such abortion should be safe. Again, UN Women and other UN agencies and pro-abortion organizations are using this kind of provision 
to say, we have to promote the legalization of abortion because then we will make it safe. And then there's another issue that's brought up in the Beijing Platform for Action that has been distorted to sexualize children and also to distort the sexuality of women. And that's paragraph 96. It says the human rights of women include the right to have control over and decide freely and responsibly on matters related to their sexuality, including sexual and reproductive health. The key word here is sexuality. How is sexuality to be defined? Well, the World Health Organization gives us this widely used definition for sexuality and says it encompasses gender identities, attitudes, pleasures, desires, fantasies, eroticism, sexual orientation, and so forth. So we'll come back to that definition a little bit later. Let's go to the third role that we have for the UN Women activities. And UN Women maintains offices at the regional and national levels to promote its agendas. So we finished part one, UN Women 101, role, structure, and activities. And we're now going to go on to UN Women Leadership Concerns, part two. The executive director of UN Women is Mrs. Pumzili Mulambo Naguka. As the executive director of UN Women, she headlined one of the most controversial abortion rights, sexual rights conferences in the world called Women Deliver. Katja Iverson is the Women Deliver founder and the president right now, and they're good buddies. And so she agreed to headline the, this event in 2019. Miss Fumzili, the executive director, she's on the right and Katja's on the left. In fact, she was part of the press conference to open up Women Deliver. And this is what she said in part. She said, we are here with you and women because this is an important space and platform for us, this Women Delivers Conference. I couldn't agree more with Katja. We are here to push back against the pushback. Well, this has become a somewhat famous line to refer to those who are opposing abortion and radical sexual rights, and even more specifically, to push back against President Trump, who's refusing to accept any abortion policies at the United Nations. So if she headlined and said, this is an important space, this, this Women Deliver Conference, what was UN Women doing there? And what was this conference promoting? This is on UN Women's website, the editorial spotlight on UN Women at Women Deliver. And this is just one of the things they were involved in. This session was called Women's Rights and LGBTI Rights Stronger Together. And the speakers included UN Women Director of Civil Society Division, Lopa Banerjee. And also it was sponsored by Outright Action International, which we'll learn about soon. So this chart, is found on UN Women's website, and you will notice the bottom circle is Women Deliver. The middle circle are the generation equality forums that they have planned in the future. And UN Women is actually saying that this Women Deliver conference is part of the Beijing review process. This is the 25th anniversary of Beijing this year, and all of these events listed here are to lead up to the a culmination of a UN General Assembly meeting on Beijing at UN headquarters. So just a little bit more about what was being promoted at this event that the UN Women Director headlined. Decriminalization and destigmatization, ending barriers to abortion, sponsored by Center for Reproductive Rights, International Planned Parenthood Federation and IPIS, where women could learn about the harm of abortion criminalization and how to combat abortion stigma Marie Stopes International hosted this event. They're also one of the foremost promoters and providers of abortion next to Planned Parenthood. Safe access to abortion, a cross-sector partnership to eliminate unsafe abortion. Then you have UNFPA and a youth organization that's sponsored by the Netherlands government, My Body, My Rights. And this is about young people having the right to love the people they want to love and live the sexual life they desire, which sounds really nice, but they define young people as young as age 10. And then you have Building the Pleasure Movement because she decides to seek pleasure, hosted by Pleasure Project, and she decides. They wanted participants to learn that too often sexual pleasure is sidelined. Feminism is about joy and pleasure. And then there are film screenings on sexual identity. They had one on 
implementing sexuality education, another one on Veronica, who is becoming someone else, changing her gender to another gender, and then one about Guyana, Trans United Campaign. And then you have decriminalization and bodily autonomy. Again, this is hosted in part by Outright Action International, one of the foremost LGBT rights promoting organizations. And this event was about non-conforming bodies, same-sex sexual conduct, sex work, abortion, women's autonomy, autonomy to make decisions, and how to undo the harms of criminalization of all of these issues. Notice sex work, that's prostitution. Again, this very conference is part of what UN Women considers part of all the, the buildup to the Beijing Platform for Action 25th anniversary and a build up to their upcoming Generation Equality Forums. Here's another partnership in which Ms. Pumzili, the Executive Director of UN Women, and Katya Iverson, the founder and CEO of Women Deliver, are in together. And it's called the Partnership for Gender Equality. This is to advise the G7. And these people on the right are all sitting on an advisory council for this entity. And again, you have these two women together promoting what? Well, if you look inside these recommendations from this advisory council group, they have examples of model laws that they want everybody to follow, like prohibit misinformation on safe abortion. This is a new movement within the pro-abortion movement where they're trying to criminalize or give penalties for anybody who portrays abortion in a negative light. They also want to provide comprehensive sexuality education and promote the right to choose and the right to have a safe abortion. Here's some specific recommendations of this Gender Equality Advisory Council with the director of UN Women who signed on to this. This is a demand letter in the context of COVID-19 calling for governments to guarantee access to sexual and reproductive health services, including abortion. And then I included this other point because it just shows how this radical feminist agenda has been infiltrating you and women for quite some time. It says governments need to create public service messaging to encourage men to do 50% of care and housework. They do not want women, even if they choose to, to be doing more than 50%. They want to engage in social engineering and dictate what should be happening in the home. Now, I just want you to look at the list of people who signed on to the Gender Equality Advisory Council recommendations. There were 35 members. They include, again, Pumzili, Mlambo, Naguka, Katja Iverson, but also we have the Executive Director of UNAIDS, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And UN Women has posted these recommendations on their website. Now, what else is the director of UN Women doing? Here you can see she is signing the She Decides Pledge. The She Decides Pledge to help women and girls realize their sexual and reproductive health rights. What does that look like? Well, the She Decides Manifesto says she decides whether, when, and with whom to have sex, which we would agree with. Women should decide this, but this is a manifesto for girls as well and for children. So they should have the right to have sex is how that is interpreted. And she, and think about the girls, and she is free to feel pleasure and to access abortion safely to decide. That's what deciding is all about. An International Planned Parenthood Federation is now the host of She Decides. So who is International Planned Parenthood Federation? Well, just a few review slides that we used in our other webinar. IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation, believes that young people are entitled to sexual pleasure and how to experience different forms of sexual pleasure is important to their health and well-being. They produce a healthy, happy, and hot publication for HIV-infected youth, which tells them they don't have to tell their sexual partners they're infected with HIV. They can have sexual pleasure. They have a right to sexual pleasure. Sex can include licking, tickling, sucking, cuddling, just have fun, explore. Again, if you've heard any of my other presentations, you'll know that our family adopted three children from Mozambique whose parents died of AIDS. And so to me personally, it is unconscionable 
that International Planned Parenthood Federation, which partners with you and women, is telling HIV infected youth that they don't have to tell their sexual partners they are infected with HIV, that laws that require them to do so violate their rights. And this publication, which is throughout all the libraries in the United States, we're finding them in various different states and cities, is for 10 year olds from Planned Parenthood in the United States, teaching them that every sex act is perfectly normal, whether it's with the same sex, yourself, or with the opposite sex. And just to give an example of what's happening in Africa, so Planned Parenthood has over 160 member affiliates. This one is the one funded by the Netherlands called Rutgers, and they're working in all these different African countries, and they're also in Pakistan, Thailand, and Vietnam. And one of their flagship comprehensive sexuality education programs is on the IPPF website as one of their member associations. One of their flagship programs, The World Starts With Me, teaches children all about petting, fondling, oral sex, and masturbation, vaginal, anal sex, petting, and masturbation don't have to affect your virginity, and tells youth the choice is yours when to lose your virginity. So enough with the executive director. Let's move on to the deputy executive director of UN Women, Mrs. Osa Regner of Sweden. Now, she came from the Swedish government. She landed this top job. She was a minister there. And it's no wonder that she was chosen when you look at the role that Sweden is playing with UN Women. The government of Sweden is the largest financial supporter to UN Women, and they have a multi-year funding agreement of 62 million US dollars. You can see their size of their donations compared to the other top 2018 donors here. UN Women has a partner spotlight on Sweden. It says, UN Women's mandate and work corresponds closely with Sweden's development priorities. And what might those be? Well, among other things, fighting for sexual and reproductive rights, code words for abortion and sexual rights. And there's a lot of money flowing into these efforts. CEDA, which is Sweden's development cooperation, funds itself and then funds other entities with their tax revenue. And they're actually funding it with 42.3 billion Swedish dollars, which equates to a little over 4 billion United States dollars going into this foreign aid. Now let's get back to Osa Regner. Um, a newspaper article also told us that she has also served before becoming a minister for the government of Sweden and then now in her position at UN Women. Before that, she also served as the Secretary General of the Swedish Association for Sexuality Education called RFSU. RFSU is a member associate organization of Planned Parenthood. Here it is listed on their website. This is how it looks in the Swedish language. This stands for RFSU. What happens with RFSU and CEDA, which is the Swedish development agency providing all that money for foreign aid, RFSU and CEDA are contributing jointly for SRHR advocacy. And they define what that means right here, where they say it includes legal and safe abortion in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And the fund works for LGBT rights, sexual education, and reproductive health. A specific project is their South Asia LGBT network, which is active in Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Here's an early publication of theirs, which defines what they mean by what is sexual and reproductive health and rights, according to RFSU, and you could say, according to the Swedish government, since this is heavily funded by the Swedish government. This includes the right to express reality and decide freely with whom you want to have sex. Again, that sounds nice when we're talking about adults. But their position is quite extreme. That's irrespective of gender. Children should have a right to have sex at the earliest ages. And just one example of their RFSU's booklets, Comprehensive Sexuality Education, is their booklet for sex for teens. And they show teens all the enjoyable sexual things that they can do together by themselves, masturbating, looking at pictures, sex positions, 
things that they can learn and so forth. So this is quite an extreme agenda being pushed by RFSU. And again, remember who was the executive secretary general of this. They also have a wide range of sex toys called Trust in Lust and other products such as lubricants. And this brings us to another publication, which is the International Technical Guidance on Sexuality Education. A few of these will be a repeat from our last webinar, but you'll notice that this is co-published by UN Women. So this would be UN Women's position on what children should be taught. And they say that abstinence means not just deciding not to have sex, but also deciding when to start having sex and with whom. Again, the right to sex. They want children to learn how to summarize key elements of sexual pleasure, to respect at all times each person's decision to be sexually active. They're concerned that adolescent girls are generally less knowledgeable about their rights concerning abortion. And they want children to define gender and biological sex and describe how they're different, gender ideology. And they ask children to differentiate between the values that they hold and that their parents and guardians hold. Now, this is promoted on UN Women's website right here. And if you look inside this, you will see that RFSU cooperated with UNESCO to create this technical guidance on comprehensive sexuality education. So what would be RFSU's interest in pushing this? Here's a clue for us. It also says in the technical guidance, there is a need to generate evidence to demonstrate the demand creation potential of CSE. CSE creates a demand because it sexualizes children, and then they're going to need provision of youth-friendly SRH services, and RFSU makes a lot of money selling those services and condoms and sex toys and you name it. All of Planned Parenthood's affiliates profit from things like condoms, abortions, hormones, contraceptives, their sexuality education programs, and sexual counseling. There's a lot of money involved in this. Now, on the flip side, who is donating to International Planned Parenthood? If you look here, UN Women is donating. You've got the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You've got UNFPA, UNAIDS, and the World Health Organization all funding the radical IPPF organization. Now, let's switch tracks a little bit and talk about UN Women's Global Civil Society Advisory Group. These are the members listed here. UN Women has chosen 25 top women to advise them on all their policies. And the one pictured here is Charlotte Bunch of the United States. Well, Charlotte Bunch was actually heavily involved in the creation of UN Women in making it the entity that it is. And she has quite an interesting background in promoting lesbian rights. This is a very old publication written by her, is called Lesbians in Revolt. And it states, the development of lesbian feminist politics as the basis for the liberation of women is our top priority. Feminists must become lesbians if they hope to end male supremacy. The only way oppressed people end their oppression is by seizing power. And being a lesbian means ending your identification with, allegiance to, dependence on, and support of heterosexuality. So these are some of the beliefs that are at the core, at the basis of the radical feminist movement that's infiltrating UN women. Here's another video that you can find online on YouTube, Charlotte Bunch bringing gay rights to feminism. Okay, so we finished UN Women leadership and we're gonna move on to part three. UN Women's abortion CSE LGBT agendas as documented in UN Women's own publications. So promoting abortion, LGBT and CSE. We're gonna start with these two publications. And the first publication is called Promoting Gender Equality in Sexual Reproductive Maternal Newborn Child and Adolescent Health. Now. That's a mouthful, and it's meant to be a mouthful because what UN is, women is doing along with all the other UN agencies is they put issues together that they know every country cares about, especially developing countries such as newborn child health, maternal health, and then they add their issues connected to it, gender equality in sexual and reproductive health, and adolescent health, which is a big theme where they're working to sexualize the children. So. How does UN Women define 
sexual and reproductive health and rights within this publication. It says, taken together, SRHR can be understood as the right for all, including the transgender, straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, to make choices regarding their own sexuality and reproduction and have the right to access information and services needed to support these choices. If you read this very carefully, you can see this actually would lead to a right for cross-sex surgeries and hormones for transgenders because that's how they can decide about their own sexuality and governments would be required to provide those. Now let's look at this publication featured on UN Women's website, Families in a Changing World. This one has a disclaimer posted by UN Women that says, the view expressed in this publication are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of UN Women. Now that's interesting. Well, then why do they have this on their website? Why did they spend so much money on it? They just don't wanna get in trouble for what they have inside here, which I'm gonna show you. Families, continuity, change, and diversity. Families are contradictory spaces for women the place where women are most likely to experience violence and discrimination. So now families are bad. Even though there's five binding UN treaties that call upon member states that member states have agreed to protect the family as the natural and fundamental unit of society. What happens is they distort the data. If you look at the data, and we're gonna have a, a full webinar on this, women who are married have much less violence and discrimination than those who are not. It's women who are in cohabitating situations who are single, who are experiencing the greater amounts of violence and discrimination. So here's how this publication is promoting abortion. It quotes the Human Rights Committee saying that state parties should provide safe, legal, and effective access to abortion. There it is in black and white, UN Women Promoting Abortion. Access to safe abortions and post-abortion care is a life-saving part of comprehensive reproductive health care. There's big fights over that term, comprehensive reproductive health care in UN negotiations, where UN agencies pretend like it doesn't include abortion, but then they interpret it that way in their publications and their activities. And also evidence shows that making abortion illegal does not reduce abortion rates. They have all sorts of statistics that are skewed and they try to scare countries into legalizing abortion in order to decrease abortion, and that simply doesn't happen. Whatever you legalize, you get more of. And here they're promoting same-sex marriage, even though UN member states never mandated this as part of UN women's portfolio. It says the Inter-American Court of Human Rights ruled that same-sex marriage should be recognized. Legalization of same-sex marriage is often a stepping stone to broader recognition of LGBTI rights. So it's not just same-sex marriage but also the right to medically assisted reproduction and adoption for same-sex couples. And they even have a chart here outlining all the countries that have legalized same-sex marriage. And then with regard to transgender people, they recognize a point that we keep making about why it's harmful. Undergoing a medical transition often leads to infertility. But then they say fertility preservation, that's preservation of the sperm and the eggs, Technology is rarely available for transgender people. So it looks like that's gonna be the big push now, government provided fertility preservation. So now this publication of UN Women is promoting CSC, access to quality education, including comprehensive sexuality education, will enable women to make empowered choices about partnerships and reproduction. That's right, because it'll promote the right to abortion. And a second area of focus for public action is they want comprehensive sexuality education scaled up. So that brings us to the Generation Equality Forums, which is listed broadly on UN Women's websites. The theme for this is Realizing Women's Rights for an Equal Future. These events were supposed to be held in Mexico and in Paris in May and July of this year. But because of COVID-19, they were postponed. It says the Generation Equality Forum will be postponed until the first half of 2021. Now let's look at what they're promoting with the Generation Equality theme here. Here is I Am Generation Equality, Pip Gardner, LGBTQI leader and activist on their website. 
I'm Generation Equality. This is Selena Jaitley, an acclaimed Indian actress, human rights activist, devoted to advocating for the rights of the members of the LGBT community in India. Now, to be fair, all of the things that UN Women promotes are not bad. They have done an excellent job in many cases in advancing the true legitimate rights of women. In fact, this is an example. They're featuring Fatma Ahmed, who's 25, who's a generation equality champion, founder of the Girls Inclusion in Sports campaign in Tanzania. But here's some of the radical stuff, again, that they're promoting through the Generation Equality Project. 12 small actions with big impact for generation equality. And look at these militant women. If you go to point number three, it actually says reject the binary. What do they mean by that? Terms such as male or female and women or men exclude non-binary. That means people who have diverse gender identities who don't identify as male or female. And it talks about ensuring the rights of transgender, gender queer, non-binary individuals and more. But if you see circled at the bottom, they actually link to the gender bred person from UN Women's website. This is almost like the rainbow flag for this movement. The gender bred person teaches children and adults alike that you may have sexual orientations that are different than your gender identities. You've been assigned your sex at birth arbitrarily. There's no biological sex. It's just what the doctor thinks you are and that you can change. You may be born into the wrong body and so forth. The radical gender identity ideology. It looks like you and women has bought into it lock, stock, and barrel. Even into the gender identity language it says everyday language, we need to reject the binary of male and female. Instead of using phrases like ladies and gentlemen or boys and girls, we're supposed to swap those for the gender neutral terms like folks, children, y'all, or gender pronouns that you need to use depending on what the person prefers could be she, her, he, him, they, them, these, their, they, her, x, them, and Z, her, X, M, and A, M. It's really absurd. Now, they've got different graphics that they're encouraging people to use to promote the gender equality forums. Now, again, to be fair, in the lower uh, left-hand corner, there's good things that are promoted also along with the gender equality forums. We are all against rape, like that graphic shows. But this is the most interesting thing I found on UN Women's website. Welcome to Equaterra, where gender equality is real. So if you ever wondered what UN Women means by gender equality, you can see it right here in this utopian country that they've created with the Equaterra government for generation equality. And you can see all the wonderful things going on here. I pulled out this picture, plan your wedding with us. It's it's two women. Then it's got two women that say, we're going to be the best moms. They're on the Freedom Avenue on their way to Reproductive Health Care Center where they have choice. Add to that same-sex couple holding hands. This is what they mean by gender equality. Look at the logo at the bottom, the NGO CSW. They helped promote the Generation Equality Forums with this PowerPoint to tell us more about it. And they say there are these six proposed themes for these generation equality conferences. Gender-based violence, bodily autonomy, and sexual reproductive health and rights, feminist movements, and leaderships are the ones that we're most concerned about. So there's a governance structure for the generation equality forums. Those that are managing and organizing this include UN Women, the governments of France and Mexico, and civil society. Civil society has an advisory group that advises the core group. And here's the members of this advisory group that has been chosen by UN Women. We just had time to research a few of them. If you start with the logo in the left-hand corner, you've got Chidi King, who heads up the Trade Union Congress Charter on International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Solidarity. You have Jessica Stern, Outright Action International, very active at the UN, pushing LGBT rights and across the world. IPIS, one of the biggest abortion providers. Feminet, on the right, look at Kenya Sex Workers Alliance. Again, choosing someone to be part of this advisory group because they're advancing the legalization of prostitution. 
Again, this is Jean Heffes, who's part of the advisory group. She is IPAS's senior policy advisor. And she brags in this article that she was instrumental in helping the CDOC committee recommend the decriminalization of abortion in line with the Maputo protocol. And IPAS on their website says, we are unapologetically focused on women and girls who want contraception or abortion, which is their real target. And they produce the handheld abortion suction kit and distribute that and sell it across the world. Jessica Stern, Outright International. This is from their website, Outright Now, ensuring LGBTI inclusion in Beijing plus 25. They're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which in this generation equality forums are vital entry point in terms of LGBTI inclusion. They want to build on their model to fight religiously motivated homophobia and transphobia at the United Nations. That brings us to the last group that we're going to focus on that are planning and running the Generation Equality Forums, and that's the Beijing Plus 25 Task Force. 30 members, the Youth Task Force, decided by UN Women, 30 young leaders that they have chosen that represent young people in all their diversity, which means it includes sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Just remember Pip Gardner that we showed you earlier. She is a member of UN Women's Beijing Plus 25 Youth Task Force. Here's another member, Rafael Alom Rahman with the Queer Muslim Project. And of course, lo and behold, we also have Bill and Melinda Gates. They're marking the 25th anniversary at the Generation Equality Forum. So they're looking forward to all of this. UN Women is aggressively promoting the LGBT agenda. These are screenshots from their website. This is back in 2012. Development and LGBTI rights. Join the latest e-discussion on inequalities. In 2013, UN Women to co-sponsor Human Rights Day event against homophobia. In 2016, we'll skip. UN Women welcomes the new Human Rights Council independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity. They're promoting the first openly lesbian congressman in Guatemala on their site. And this one in 2019, UN Women hosts the first high-level event on gender diversity and non-binary identities at UN headquarters. And five LGBT activists that you need to know. So if there's any question about UN Women's LGBT agenda, just look for these on their website. So we're coming to the end of our presentation today. We've discussed UN Women 101, the role, structure, and activities of UN Women. Part two was UN Women leadership concerns. Part three, UN Women's promotion of abortion, CSC, and LGBT as documented in their own publications and their generation equality forums. We learned that pushing all of these things are the top two leaders of UN Women. I want you to remember that gender equality encompasses, according to UN Women, all of these agendas. So those who are working in your country, the UN agencies to promote gender equality, in addition to seeking to advance legitimate women's rights, they're also using gender equality as the banner to promote abortion and LGBT rights and comprehensive sexuality education for children. So that brings us to the end. This is what it's all about. If you think about the agenda I just laid out before you from you and women, it starts with confusing children, even adults, about their gender, which once someone is confused about their gender, it's very hard to go on and establish a family to get married to the opposite sex and have children. And then they're corrupting the innocence and health of children by sexualizing them. That also makes it very difficult to, to marry and maintain a stable marriage and family. And then, of course, the assault on life is a direct assault on the family. All of these things are being promoted by UN Women. So what can we do to protect the family from these assaults from UN Women and other UN agencies? Here's our family protection plan. First of all, you've taken the first step today. We're so excited to have all of you from so many different countries all across the world. You have just been informed of the dangers of UN Women's agenda. And you need to now help us raise awareness. 
We're going to be posting links to this webinar on our website, and we ask you to share the link and encourage others to learn more about the harmful agendas of UN Women. And then investigate, what is UN Women doing in your country? Find out which parts of your government they're partnering with, and what are they doing with International Planned Parenthood, or IPIS, or these abortion groups? And then number three, work to get your government to challenge harmful UN Women policies and to defund UN Women until it is reformed and these things are eliminated from their agenda. Also check to see if your government is on the executive board of UN Women where they could start suggesting changes and demanding changes from within. Also as part of the Get Informed, this webinar is the second webinar in our overall international family law and global health policies online learning course. A few weeks ago, we did a webinar in the World Health Organization. Their agenda, which is very similar to the UN Women agenda that I exposed, we encourage you to go to our website and watch that if you haven't. Upcoming on June 2nd will be our next webinar on UNFPA, United Nations Fund for Population Activity. This will be, again, Tuesday, June 2nd, the same time, 9 a.m. Arizona time, and it will be UNFPA Exposed the abortion and youth sexualization agendas. UNFPA has a, an obsessive focus on youth in mobilizing them to advocate for abortion and LGBT rights, and we'll show you all of this through their publication. So all this information and a recording of this webinar, you can find at familywatch.org webinars. And we strongly encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter so you can get notice of all of our webinars at familywatch.org. This is a free service we offer. You'll also receive news of what's happening on family issues around the world and our reports from the United Nations. So thank you for joining with us today. You've taken the first step in becoming aware. Let's take the next step and share this information with as many people as we can and call our governments to act to root out the problems and the agendas that UN Women is pushing in various countries around the world. Thank you.